Okay, uh, I think we can get started. Um, hello everyone again. Uh, welcome to this tutorial session of open uh, cloud infrastructure at scale for next uh, generation. Um, this, is, this tutorial is sponsored by uh, Futureway Technology. Uh, um, my name is Yin Xiong. I'm from the Cloud Lab at Futureway. Uh, so in this tutorial, we will introduce you and uh, discuss uh, one of the projects called uh, Centeras, and is uh, one of the projects we are doing at uh, Cloud Lab. And the vision of the project called Centeras is to be the open uh, next generation cloud infrastructure at scale. So that's where the tutorial title uh, come from. And so hopefully this uh, project actually is open source. Uh, we are in the process to donate to the Linux Foundation. Um, hopefully uh, through this tutorial session, uh, you will learn something and get familiar with uh, projects and terrors. Uh, hopefully uh, you also are interested in joining the community and uh, realize, uh, help to realize the vision of Centeras. So with that, I will, uh, we will start this uh, tutorial session. This is the agenda for the next three hours. Um, I will give an overview of the projects and Terras. Um, after that, um, Fu and Deepak from the Cloud Lab, uh, for our co-workers, they will discuss, uh, introduce you the NISA, which is a sub-project uh, of on the Centaurus uh, for the networking solutions. And after that, um, Xiaolin and Hongwei will discuss a project called Arctos. Uh, Arctos is a sub-project for Centaurus for the compute. Uh, they will more focus on how to integrate with NISA, the network solution, make the Arctos a uh, scaled uh, cloud networking with XDP. So after that, uh, Dean Yin will uh, introduce you and discuss Kuba H project. And actually, in fact, the Kuba H project is not uh, a pro part of the Centaurus. It's actually official saying safe project. Uh, but uh, we are also working on the Kuba H, uh, Kuba H project a lot. So we want to uh, also give you uh, introduction, introduce you the Kuba H project and uh, discuss here some information that the latest uh, change or latest uh, upgrade or development on the Kuba H side. So finally, uh, Annie Mai from our uh, open source team, uh, she is open source expert and she's also a member, a board member of Sensafe. So she will talk and show you the community current status, uh, uh, current status of Centaurus and uh, community uh, involvement partnership. Um, and hopefully you can join the community and uh, realize again the vision of Centaurus. And since this is a tutorial, we want the session to be more interactive. So if you have any question, uh, we'll raise your hand and start where we're, uh, where we're uh, hopefully try to answer your questions. So with that, um, so let's start give an overview of Centaurus, what it is Centaurus and why we're doing uh, just a project. And well, there's a couple of challenges this project tried to uh, solve or the problem we try to solve. And the first one is the compute, um, uh, computer network management uh, scalability. Um, in the current, uh, as more and more uh, customer move this uh, enterprise, move the workload into the cloud, for cloud operator is really uh, the old constantly facing the challenge of how to manage a large cluster of computers. And currently, um, most of the solution in the open source, uh, they manage a couple of the thousand uh, computer nodes. In this project, uh, we will try to solve this problem to scale down 50,000 computer nodes and also scale to uh, maybe two million network endpoint provisioning and manage all this, the network uh, endpoints. So that's one of the challenges, the problem you try to solve by the uh, projects and terrors. And the second problem we try to solve or challenge the problem is a uh, unified infrastructure. Well, on the open source community, we have many uh, open source platforms, open source servers to manage different uh, type of resources uh, like VM, uh, VMs and containers, serverless. And so one of the problem uh, we actually need to ask by many customers is they want to have a unified platforms to manage all those resources. So they don't have to manage two or three or different uh, platforms uh, to reduce the management costs. 
So one of the uh, problem we try to solve is uh, try to develop a platform that that same platform the API uh, for deploy and manage uh, the VMs, container serverless, even bare matters. So at the same time uh, with the same platforms. So this is a challenge that we try to we try to uh, we try to we try to solve the challenges and the problems. The uh, also uh, the same network solutions for provisioning and the routing. Uh, the VMs, containers, and all the workloads that deploy on the on the, on the, on the same platform. So this is the second uh, challenge we had. The third challenge that projects and tariffs try to solve uh, is high performance cloud networking solutions. Um, to many cloud operator, uh, network is continue to be the bottleneck for large uh, large scale compute uh, compute clouds, a large scale cloud. In fact, I would say this, and so there's always customer always uh, want a faster faster provisioning of VMs provisioning the workloads in and, and we found that uh, uh, a significant part at least the 50 percent of part of the latency is happening on the network side and the most of uh, a significant portion of the cloud uh, incidents actually are uh, so network related so uh, produce the high performance network uh, solution is a quite a challenge and uh, this project try to solve, uh, address these problems uh, by uh, working on the different, um, uh, different ways, innovation ways to solve the network uh, scalability and the performance problems. So that's one of the other goals this project and Taras try to solve. And the last one but not least is the distributed cloud platform. We see many uh, platforms doing H, uh, uh, H nodes in the H computer will say this, uh, but uh, we think that from platform perspective, we want to design a platform that literally support both data center computer nodes and H computer nodes with the same platforms. So we want to support network multi uh, network and multi tenancy at the edge, and so we we address uh, the problems that we have in the many actually many operators um, facing. Is the network security, network uh, network policies, and network latency problem for the peer, for the computer nodes at the edge and running the application at the edge. So this is a we want we call a distributed cloud platform. Is that what we mean by that? Is that the computer platform manager nodes, not only the data center nodes, cloud data center nodes, but also the computers, computer nodes at the edge side. And uh, the difference of many of the different is uh, on the edge side, as you know. Uh, the network latency is not uh, latency has some issues. Uh, the security, so a lot of the problems we try to solve uh, by this project. And um, also from resource perspective, especially for operator perspective, uh, when a customer uh, requests a application deploy on the cloud, where to actually uh, replace the workload, where we start the VMs, and this uh, that's what we call scheduling. And not necessarily in the, in the in the data centers. We want to deploy the user applications on the place on the nodes that are close to the customer. So it could be on the edge nodes or could be on the data center nodes. So there's another uh, challenge or trends I will try to solve by the projects and tariffs. So this is our view of the projects and tariffs. And again, it's an open source project. Uh, we open source it. We are in the process to donate the, pro, uh, the project to Linux Foundation. Uh, we call this uh, open. Uh, we call this project the open distributed cloud infrastructure. Uh, in fact, we rebuild it uh, with the cloud native approach. And this project, uh, content, uh, including two sub projects, uh, the project Arctus is a compute is a cloud compute project for the Centaurus. It basically is a manage manage the clusters at a scale, and they unify. The orchestration APIs for VMs, containers, serverless, and uh, as as well as bio matters, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And then the uh, the second project, uh, Misa, is a network project for Centaurus. And network the Misa project, and we will discuss more detail on the, the next section. It's the virtual is a network solution, a virtual network solution at scale for the cloud. Uh, you will have a data plan and a management plan. And uh, in the data plan, we use XDB technology to uh, to forward the routing and forwarding the package at speed. So this is our all Centaurus architecture. Again, uh, you include that the Centaurus project include 
compute, which is Arcturus, and the network solutions, which is Misa. But we also have uh, uh, Centaurus UI and the global scheduling uh, for the Centaurus side. I'm not going through the detail of this architecture, uh, but I do want to mention a few uh, architecture uh, highly highlights. The first is the compute and the network in, uh, is independent of each other. So even though we, uh, these two projects actually are independent of each other, you can use uh, MISA uh, network solution standalone and work with a other open source software like OpenStack uh, or Kubernetes. Uh, in fact, uh, with the first thing that we do is actually the uh, MISA networking solution can work natively uh, with open uh, Kubernetes and also working with OpenStack. And the Arctos is also independent computer project. They can work with any other uh, network solution network solution that is say in the container network interface, say and uh, compatible. So you could work with Flannels, you work with Kinecos, all those network solutions on the open source side. So there's two projects that are independent of each other. However, on the uh, Centaurus umbrella, we integrate uh, these two projects and become a one end-to-end uh, -end platform. And the, the second uh, highlight is this from this architecture, the Arctos actually evolved from Kubernetes architecture. However, we make a, a major core change to be, become a more a cloud native infrastructure. So we will discuss more a little bit on that uh, in the later slides. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, MISA is based on kernel XDB program uh, and the Geneva protocol. And this is a new, uh, a, a new uh, solutions that we come up with, uh, try to help, try to solve the problem, the network, uh, uh, network, I think is network uh, throughput and network uh, throughput and concurrency problems in the performance uh, for the package forwarding. Again, uh, we will have more uh, slides uh, in this tutorial. Uh, to discuss MISA. And uh, for also for Centaurus, architecture uh, overall is native support of multi-tenant uh, computer network solutions. So from the uh, beginning of the design, we actually uh, there's a uh, design for infrastructure for build public cloud or private cloud. So a multi-tenant is built in, is native. Uh, I know some of the uh, open source softwares uh, out there and uh, is a more designed for private uh, cloud uh, means that, and it may not have a multi-tenant uh, features there, but for this project, and we intend to be a platform to build public or private cloud with multi-tenancy in mind. And the next uh, architecture highlight is this architecture actually compatible with CRI container uh, container uh, runtime interface, say SI container storage interface, and uh, say NI container network interface. But we're uh, using that for both containers and the VMs. So VMs also were uh, compatible with uh, those interface, which is our de facto interface uh, currently in the cl cloud native world. So I need to be more of Project Arcturus. Yeah, again, I mentioned earlier, Arctos architecture is derived from Kubernetes, and but we make a key redesign and changes or we call extensions uh, to the uh, to the platform. So it make a real multi-tenant cloud native infrastructure to support containers, VMs, and other type of work uh, work uh, resources or workload resources. So first uh, major change we made is the for scalability. Uh, every component in the Arctos architecture uh, can be partitioned. That including the API server, that including the store which called etcd. You can partition etcd. You can partition the uh, API server uh, to make it scalable. Deploy at the regional level, and they also including the uh, controllers uh, in the controllers uh, in the architecture itself. So in the Kubernetes architecture, there are many controllers or operators. You will see uh, that control some of the deployment, uh, some of the uh, application uh, workload, and that uh, part will also uh, make a major change to we can partition the workload to the increase the our own architecture throughput, increase our own architecture scalability. That's the first uh, change we make into the Kubernetes platform. And the second one is the multi-tenant model. Uh, we call a virtualized Kubernetes. 
uh, Kubernetes is designed from beginning with actually no, no uh, multi-tenancy support. And I know the community is uh, uh, still working on that. Uh, we come uh, with an innovative approach to uh, solve the multi-tenant problem for Kubernetes. And then every, uh, for each tenant, they, they look at the, the physically one cluster, but for each tenant, they feel this cluster belongs to them. Uh, so that's what we call virtualized Kubernetes. And that's what the, one of the major changes we made uh, to the uh, Kubernetes uh, architecture. The third uh, major change or key design we made is the unified runtime. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, one of the challenge uh, in the uh, industry where customer or enterprise and they really want to one uh, same platforms, one platform to manage uh, the resources they have. We either is virtual machine with this container with other type of workload or resources. And so this uh, one of the design we made is uh, unify the management runtime for the VM and containers. Uh, so we have the same uh, we have the same uh, agent running on the host that support uh, manage the lifecycle of VM and containers. And uh, we are in the process to manage the uh, serverless life cycles too for their, uh, for their applications or runtimes. The first uh, change we made uh, is to introduce the network objects uh, and isolation. Uh, today in the Kubernetes platform, you can have, um, you can have, a, you, can, you can deploy different network solutions as long as the network solutions is CNI compatible. Uh, however, we introduce network objects that can you can create a, a VPCs and you create a subclass within the Kubernetes platform, or in this case, in the Arctos platforms, so that you can deploy VMs or containers that lie on the, within your network or within your uh, uh, VPC that naturally will isolate each other. And that's part of a water density model that by introducing a new network objects uh, in the uh, Kubernetes platform. And that way we can create a custom, each tenant can create the many VPCs they have, they can create a many a subnet they have, and then they deploy containers, deploy the applications, and they deploy the virtual machines that are on top of, uh, within that VPC or within the uh, subnet that will not communicate with other, uh, uh, with other tenants or uh, resources uh, on the other tenant or VPCs. So that's our first major change we made, uh, extension we made to the Kubernetes platforms. Um, the final one, but not the least, is the edge support. Uh, we actually uh, follow the Kubernetes edge platform. I mentioned that uh, Python and design Python. We uh, extend the Arctos to can manage the computer node uh, on the edge side, not in the data centers, but on the edge side, so that uh, we manage the uh, computer nodes they're both at data center and agent nodes in the same way, same API, uh, same experience. And however, the, the, the uh, nodes that could be in the cloud data center or could be in the edge side. So we natively support that uh, from, the, uh, from the beginning of the design uh, for Arctos architectures. So this is a need to be background of Arctos project and uh, again, uh, our co-workers will, dis uh, will discuss and introduce more about uh, Arctos uh, inside. And the, the MISA project, which is a, a network project for the Centaurus, and we're based on including actually a, a data plan and a management plan. And the data plan is built on uh, uh, is based on the XTP eBPF technology in a Geneva protocol, I think I mentioned earlier. The, uh, for those that, uh, uh, don't know the XDP is uh, is stand for Express Data Pass and is a, a Unix kernel technology uh, allow you to run your program uh, within the kernel and to process the network package in network traffic. So we're using the uh, XDP slash eBPF uh, technology to build a MISAS data plan and the Pre, uh, the preliminary result, uh, preliminary result is uh, the routing and data plan and the speed uh, achieves uh, very low latency uh, goals that we have. And then the uh, MISA management plan is building on uh, Kubernetes, CRD, and operator framework. Uh, so you can manage the MISA 
uh, data plan from the Kubernetes uh, infrastructure itself. So we uh, build in the VPC uh, CRD objects, uh, subnet CRD objects, endpoint CRD objects, all the network objects that were created through the Kubernetes, uh, using Kubernetes CRD and operating framework. And that way you can manage uh, the, the data plans uh, through the Kubernetes itself. Uh, sometimes we call it a cloud native uh, SDN, but it's a small version of uh, a management plan to manage the visa that may need to focus on the data plan. One of the things that uh, the MISA, we think it can scale to a large number of provisioning uh, networking, including the uh, VPC network and the endpoint, is we naturally partition of the cloud network uh, by the actually tenant VPCs, tenant subnet. So the routings and the scalabilities, they're all uh, partitioned by the VPCs and subnet. So that way we can scale out uh, the network architectures can provision in minutes and minutes of the uh, network uh, endpoints at the same time for large scale clusters. And since we're using XTP, uh, we have even been proof that uh, the latency is very low when we're forwarding forward the uh, network traffic between VMs or between containers or between containers and the VMs. I think that's our, our view for the projects and terrace. Uh, we do have a booth uh, in the, uh, the hopefully, uh, if you're interested, you can visit our booth uh, called Future Way and or has a lot of information there, including the, the, the uh, white paper for Centaurus, uh, some of the videos we have and the blog we have for the NISAs, for actors. So uh, welcome you to the, uh, the, the, our virtual booth. I think that's the end of our, my overview for Projects and Terrace. And I probably open a couple, couple minutes for quizzing, uh, Q, uh, questions, uh, if I, you have. And then, uh, then we go on to the next session. Any question? Okay, if no, uh, I will um, stop sharing and then I will continue to the next uh, uh, section is uh, your full and the deep power discover of Lisa is a novel approach to network virtualization. Deepak, I'm back to you. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Dr. Chong. Uh, uh, that, yeah, uh, thank you, everybody. Hi, this is uh, Deepak Vish from Future Way Cloud Lab. So just kind of a recap. Uh, so we're going to have uh, three presentations uh, coming up, and each presentation is going to be around uh, one hour long. So the intent is to have 45 or 50 minutes or so uh, uh, towards the presentation itself. And then at the end, we'll have about 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. And uh, the, we, what we are doing is we, uh, we're using a format uh, whereby uh, uh, the, the, these presentations are pre-recorded, you see. So this is proven to be pretty productive in other online conferences as well. So essentially what this does is, you know, as we are playing the, the presentation, audience attendees can ask questions in a chat window, you know, while the presentation is going on. So that way we can have more interaction, Q and A's, and then at the same time, you know, we can control the overall time as well. So I think that's uh, pretty much, uh, and then uh, we're gonna start off with the very first presentation on MISAR cloud networking. Uh, Magni, you wanna start the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, the audio is not there. Audio details for meets our network. You want to start from the beginning?
Hello, everybody. This is uh, Deepak Vich from Future Way Cloud Lab. I, along with my colleague uh, Futran, will cover uh, 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 details for meets our network virtualization layer for our next generation uh, CentOS uh, cloud platform. So just kind of a very high level description of what Mitsar is. Mitsar is a programmable data plane for multi-tenant network services at scale. Uh, to set the background, why, why do we need an, uh, another uh, networking, cloud networking solution? Why do we need that? So we, we built just, uh, we'll kind of go through that, you know, we'll set the background. Uh, we built Centaurus uh, cloud platform to meet the needs of very large enterprises, which may typically include, you know, for Fortune 100 companies who deploy their infrastructure at very massive scale, okay? So the large scale uh, cloud platforms such as Centaurus, they need to be able to scale up in order to support enterprises' uh, entire uh, global footprint. You see. So in order for us to be able to accommodate all that, we, we set a design target such as, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, we may have a scenario where you have 100,000 virtual machine endpoints uh, per network and in combination with many of these networks, okay? So you can see the scale. The, and the, 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 envi the environment, the cloud environment is very dynamic, you know? So you have all these uh, the lightweight containers and serverless functions come and go. In a fraction of a second, you may have thousands of these endpoints that they need to be provisioned and managed, basically. So it's not a typical old uh, static environment where you maybe spin up VMs few times, maybe 100 times a day, max. So as, uh, as opposed to that, we have a very dynamic environment. So we wanted to support rapid provisioning of cloud resources very quickly and efficiently. Okay. So we set up a performance goal in order to achieve high throughput, low latency, and consistent uh, network performance in a multi-tenant environment. So that's the key thing, multi-tenancy VPC is built from ground up and it's a first class citizen as part of our uh, platform. So now from a scalability uh, perspective, so just come, uh, going back to VPC, this is similar to what uh, cl public cloud uh, providers uh, provide as well, VPC uh, uh, multi-tenant uh, environment uh, in uh, AWS, Google, Microsoft. And uh, from a scalability uh, goals perspective, uh, our networking solution should be capable of provisioning VMs or container endpoints concurrently thousands per minute, you know, per, and be capable of routing and managing communication among millions of network endpoints, and be capable of elastic scaling of network uh, services, be able to create an extensible cloud network of pluggable network functions. We'll get into a lot of details about that. You know, we have uh, uh, kind of very interesting uh, uh, kind of discussion on that. And then last but not the least, the, the unified network of various uh, workload types. So one common interface, network interface for uh, various type of uh, uh, workload, you know, such as container, VM, doesn't matter what the, what the workload is, uh, you get the same networking interface when you provision or manage uh, 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 an endpoint. So that's, uh, uh, that, that was uh, just uh, kind of a background. Now with that as a background and requirements, uh, we, we came to the conclusion that the flow programming, current uh, flow programming, you know, uh, typically employed by OVS, uh, like solution, networking solution, may not be the, the, the right uh, uh, model in order for us to be able to scale up to this, uh, you know, uh, there's such a large uh, environment, okay? So we'll get into a lot of details, you know, what that, what that means. Now, uh, so what are the problem? Why, why do we think that the flow rules are, uh, are not gonna be able to meet such an, uh, such an environment, okay? So, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the, the, the key thing is, uh, is in a, just to kind of set the background, in, in, a, uh, in a typical network uh, solution such as OVS, a control plane programs flow tables on each of the virtual switches on each host using the open, open flow protocol, okay? 
And then uh, suppose a customer wants to add a new virtual endpoint into a specific network. So, and then let's assume that network has uh, 100 uh, endpoints uh, spread across uh, multiple hosts, okay? So now what control plane, when you're adding a new endpoint, what control plane will do is it will program uh, flows on all the other hosts that have the VMs in this particular network where this endpoint is being added so that those VMs can reach the, the newly added uh, uh, endpoint VM in this case, you see. So you have to go and program, add a flow rule uh, table on all the virtual switches on all those hosts, okay? And additionally, the control plane also program flows on the virtual switch for the VM uh, where this host uh, and the new endpoint is being added so that the new VM can reach rest of the network, you see. So you can see the problem actually, it's about the number of flows per host and the number of hosts must be programmed, you know, uh, when you when you adding uh, new endpoints. You see, so the total programming overhead becomes really very massive. It becomes product of the number of endpoints in a host multiplied by the the, the number of hosts in the uh, in the overall uh, system, basically. You see. So uh, so this results in the, you know the the you can see the the it's very obvious you know such uh, an architecture does not meet the scaling goal. The provisioning of uh, rapid provisioning of such a massive scale. And then at the runtime packet processing, because you have so many uh, flow rules to deal with, it becomes uh, the, the CPU memory utilization becomes a big bottleneck actually. You see. So that's what, uh, that, that's what uh, we meant, you know, that the current uh, flow rule programming model uh, doesn't, measure up to the, the, the such a large uh, scale environment. So to address these uh, scaling problems, uh, challenges, we built, uh, we call meets our network uh, solution cloud networking in order to route traffic for virtual networks and be able to provision endpoints in uh, such an environment. Okay. Now, uh, there are, uh, State of the art. Uh, there's a lot of work going on, actually. So, uh, so currently, OVN, the the, the controller, control plane uh, folks are uh, doing a pretty good uh, job of kind of optimizing uh, the 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 moving away from old uh, neutron uh, control plane towards uh, the new OVN controller which is based on the optimized databases uh, versus the RabbitMQ, uh, RabbitMQ uh, model, which they employed as part of the Neutron, Neutron uh, control network. So they've done a great job actually. So adding a single port uh, uh, reduced from tens of seconds uh, close to, uh, to, to one second. So this is really great actually. So uh, this is a good achievement, but it, this is still not enough, you see, especially, that it still doesn't scale up to the 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 uh, uh, the the, uh, the scale, you know, the the environment which we are talking about. And the, the 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 reason being the fact that the underlying problem is is the fact that it's still based on top of OVS and which uh, typically uses uh, control, uh, flow rules to be able to manage the overall uh, networking environment. Actually, so so in, that's the OVS uh, flow rule programming model is the is the is the uh, uh, main challenge you know so there's been a lot of work done uh, uh, Google and Ramida you know uh, these folks they're trying to minimize the flow rules in their system so what they do is uh, they can they what they they send all their packets to a thing called hoverboard actually and then they monitor periodically all the flows in the system in, in, in the hoverboard and then find specific flows to be offloaded uh, uh, to uh, uh, using direct path, uh, fast path uh, with the with flow rules. So on a, on a periodic basis, uh, they selectively offload uh, some of the flows out of a hoverboard and use direct path you know, with their, their uh, hardware optimizations uh, uh, in order for uh, 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 and two endpoints to talk to each other, basically. So, so you can see that all of these efforts, OVN, Andromeda, it uh, pretty much boils down to a single idea, is that uh, to find ways to reduce the number of flow rules passed down to the data path, okay? 
So, so we, we, we stopped for a second. So we said, you know, uh, we asked ourselves a question. So what does it take for us to build a next generation overlay network that doesn't use any flows at all, okay? So what if uh, we program the data plane just like, uh, just like you would build, uh, uh, build a regular distributed, uh, distributed system application? So do away with all of these, uh, these uh, uh, flow rules altogether and, and build, it, uh, build the data plane uh, as, a, as a regular distributed system application. So we took that uh, tag or approach and went with that model, distributed uh, system application uh, model, basically. Okay, and then uh, uh, there's no need in such an environment. You know, we we working in a very uh, this is a very specialized use case, cloud networking. Everything is very deterministic, so there's no need for Mac learning or flooding the chan for flooding the tunnel. You know, uh, 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 those kind of uh, age-old networking design. Design so so we uh, so that's what we we uh, we we kind of uh, we you know, there's no need for uh, such uh, 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 such uh, design uh, 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 old uh, networking designs okay so now so uh, XDP so. Uh, just want to briefly touch upon you know what XDB is because this is what we we use. So instead of using micro uh, the 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 flow rules, we built the entire networking uh, cloud networking layer using XDP. And uh, so, but, but before we get into that, I just want to kind of a high level describe what XDP XDP Express Data Path. So in uh, 2018, a group of kernel engineers published a paper about the XDP, okay? But this has been going on for a while. I think this uh, came out around 2016. And uh, the goal, uh, the, the, the key, uh, the goal is to run custom eBPF programs within the device driver of the NIC, okay? So these eBPF uh, programs are really small programs, 4K in instruction size, written in, uh, generic language such as C, but you can actually run, uh, 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 write them in uh, Rust as well, okay? And these programs are verifiable programs. So that when the kernel loads them, uh, 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 so uh, without worrying about uh, uh, causing any possibility for a crash, so, uh, uh, so it verifies, kernel upfront uh, verifies uh, that there's no loop, there's no wrong pointers or memory uh, allocation you know, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, I see. So, so it's all these programs are verifiable. And once the program is loaded as part of the kernel, so when the packet comes in from the NIC, you can actually run pretty much very high level logic in a typical data structures, such as, you know, array, hash tables, and then make an appropriate action to the packets. And those actions are typically either pass them to the networking subsystem within the kernel, within the kernel or transmit them back to the NIC, or even redirect them to another interface or drop it, okay? So that's kind of a, a pretty high level uh, description of uh, what XDP is, okay? And so that's what we ended up do, do, doing actually. So we, as I mentioned, so we built our entire uh, networking solution based on XDP uh, uh, protocol. Uh, so what we did was, so we take an approach and say that, okay, uh, so we remove everything. We, we got rid of uh, open v switch, Linux bridges, IP tables, and we replaced them with XDB program on, on, on the main interface. Uh, uh, and we call it a transit XDP basically. Okay. And, uh, and then we have another XDP program on the VF pair that connects to a container or a VM and we call it a transit agent XDP. Okay. And these two programs share eBPF maps, which are programmable from the user space by, uh, by the transit daemon. See, you can see that here, transit daemon, transit XTP, and then you have a transit uh, agent uh, XTP. And uh, you may have multiple uh, networking interfaces uh, on, on a host. So for each one of those uh, interfaces, we have uh, a corresponding transit uh, XTP program and that corresponds to a droplet. So for each interface, my network interface, you'll have a droplet basically. So that's the, that's the kind of overall architecture. So when the management plane 
uh, 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 from a management uh, plane uh, perspective, if we would like to push the, the, the configuration, you just make an RPC call to the user space program, and these user space program, that, uh, the, the transit daemon, will populate your regular maps, hash tables inside the kernel, basically, okay? And in, in, a, in, a, in, in a cloud, uh, in a cloud uh, when you're building network functions, uh, network uh, 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 functions, the, the functionality you typically have can be pretty much uh, reduced to three or four constructs. See, and they are typically, you either encapsulate or decapsulate a packet, or you modify the outer packet header and forward it, modify the inner packet header and forward it, or drop the unwanted uh, packet, you see. These are the typical, the, 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 the constructs, uh, constructs uh, you, uh, you employ when you're building services such as you know, NAT or your load balancing and you know, the, the, so, the, so, so, and so we are able to perform all of this and we are, are able to build the network services using the 4K uh, uh, XDP program, basically. So that's kind of a high level architecture, what we, what we have, okay. Now, uh, drilling down uh, uh, more into it, so, so, uh, uh, so if you uh, drill down more into it, the performance packet uh, architecture standpoint, we have these uh, transit XDP programs running on RxQ of the NIC of the main interface, okay, on every host, okay. And we have a transit agent running on the RxQ of the VF pair. So whenever packet comes in, uh, and the ingress packet uh, comes in, we can redirect it to the TXQ bypassing the entire kernel in the root namespace uh, to the container, okay? And for the egress packet, we take the packet from the container and redirect it to the TX path on the main interface. Uh, and, and then again, we bypass the root namespace. So that's kind of a high level uh, architecture we have for, for Meta, okay? Now, <clears throat> so, uh, so, you can see that, so what we have done is, uh, so we have done, what we have done so far is that we have actually, uh, 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 we look at the, the, the network interfaces on, on all the hosts in the data center and we treat them as uh, programmable tiny servers basically, you see. So, uh, so the, you have all these tiny servers running on the, on the, on the uh, every network inter interface of the every host in the data center. So we can load programs there. We can have regular data structure. And, 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 and so we, and then we have a, a mapping table that, that uh, say, uh, so that has a mapping. So the, we have an endpoint, where is, where is it hosted that endpoint? So you have that mapping uh, in, in, in that, uh, on those hosts. Uh, all the hosts in the in the data center, and then we pick we put all these uh, pro exact same programs uh, over all the hosts in the data center. So that's what our, our basically the overall overarching uh, uh, architecture is. Okay. Now, uh, so uh, so what we do is on a management plane perspective, we assign label to one of the hosts and we call it a bouncer. Okay. Bouncer is just an abstract object in the management plane, basically. Okay, so uh, now when we creating a new endpoint, okay, so as you know, as I mentioned that in initially, that when you're creating a new endpoint, you have to go across all of the hosts and then update the update the the flow rules on the on the virtual switches of uh, every host for that uh, network. As opposed to that, when you're creating an uh, endpoint, a container, for example, we do two RPC calls. The first RPC call goes to the host in which we are going to provision the container and basically tell the XTP program that your bouncer is on host P, okay? So you can see that here, that we're adding this new endpoint, 10.0.0.1, and we tell that endpoint, your endpoint, uh, uh, your bouncer is on host P. That's the only thing we do. And then we have another RPC call that tells uh, 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 that uh, 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 RPC call to the bouncer host that uh, we call the bouncer host that 10.001 uh, uh, is hosted at uh, host A, okay? 
So we just need these two RPC calls to provision the container and that's it. That's pretty much it, okay? Now, uh, so let's say now uh, we add another container. Uh, so uh, we uh, add another endpoint and we do exactly the same thing. So uh, um, are we telling the bouncer on host B uh, that uh, we have, an, uh, uh, we have uh, another endpoint in 10002, which is hosted at host C, okay? And that's it and we're all done basically. And on host C, we tell that endpoint 10002, your bouncer is on host B basically, okay? So um, these uh, RPCs are standard RPC calls, gRPC calls, basically. They typically take, for example, 20 milliseconds for RPC call to the bouncer, to update the uh, bouncer, and then maybe more or less about 300 milliseconds or so to provision the, the, the container uh, uh, endpoint. Now, uh, from a packet uh, processing perspective, so what happens is, so when the packet, when the endpoint on host A wants to communicate with endpoint on host B, the first step is that the XTP program takes the packet and encapsulate into a Gini packet and then transmits the packet out to the bouncer because that program doesn't really know anything about the network, okay? It doesn't know where the host, uh, the endpoint 10.002 is, except that you have a packet, send it uh, blindly to the bouncer. So it sent it to the bouncer B, okay. Now, <clears throat> so this, this is where the, the packet uh, goes to bouncer B. So, uh, so host B is where we actually have the mapping, okay. That says that 10001 is the host A and 10002 is on host C. So we rewrite the outer packet. Uh, so on the bouncer, when the packet comes to bouncer, the packet uh, rewrites the outer packet to host C and sends the packet out to host C. And then we're done basically. So packet uh, originated from host A, went to bouncer and from bouncer sent it out to, to uh, host C, okay? Uh, however, you can see that there's a problem there, you see. So uh, there's, uh, by doing all this, we've added an additional extra hop in between. So every packet that goes from source uh, endpoint to the destination endpoint, you have to go through a bouncer to do that, you see. So that's, uh, that's problematic. So when you're dealing with the line rate uh, performance of uh, packet processing, this is a major problem, okay? So we, so we decided, okay, so how are we gonna solve this problem? So we, what we did was we added, uh, uh, we, uh, so we uh, modified our protocol so that we actually bypass, uh, in order for us to bypass this harm, okay? So we changed the XTP program and added an ARP request basically, see. And changing the R I I XTP is pretty straightforward actually. Dynamically, uh, we just uh, write the C code, loading actually on the fly without any packet interruption at all, you see. And also modified a little bit uh, the transit agent XTP program behavior in which we have to add a little bit of more information into a Geneva option. Okay, we'll get into that detail actually. Okay. So. <clears throat> So, uh, uh, so now what happens is, so we, uh, so, so the ARP uh, uh, request comes from host A, okay? And uh, uh, comes from the uh, endpoint 10.0.0.1. And then it says, uh, and it queries for uh, host 10.0.0.2. Where is 10.0.0.2? It goes to the bouncer, the ARP, re ARP request. But uh, the bouncer has the ARP responder capability built in. So what it actually does is it replies back to the host A, says that I know where 10002 is, and he modifies the Geneva option saying that 10002 is actually on host C. Okay. So when the packet uh, packet is received back at host A, it adds uh, this to the local endpoint map. So that saying that you know 10.002 is at host C. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, uh, so now when the first packet for the, so now the ARP processing is over. So the host A knows how to reach 10.002 uh, 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 because he knows that uh, that endpoint is in host C, okay? So when the first packet comes uh, from host A, uh, the flow, uh, the coming out uh, uh, the, from, from 
we added just one single bit in the Gini packet and say that this is a direct message, okay? So now when the packet is received on host C, it knows that it actually uh, came from host, which is hosting 10.0001, okay? So, uh, and, and then, uh, then we uh, 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 populate the endpoint maps with uh, 10.0.1 on host C, and now we have direct uh, connection for the, so on the host C, we say on the, uh, on the, uh, when the packet uh, on the way back, uh, he populates that table uh, uh, saying that host uh, 10.0.1 is on host, uh, host, uh, host A, okay? So, uh, so, uh, uh, so the, the, the populates the endpoint map with 10.0.0.1 to the host C, and now we have a direct connection for the first packet in the flow between the two containers. So, so, and then from then on, all the remaining packets, they go direct basically, you see, from host A to the uh, host B without going through, uh, going via a uh, bouncer. So we gotten rid of the extra hop in the middle basically. So what we have done so far is that we have provisioned an endpoint in a very constant time across the number of RPCs, two RPCs as, as I mentioned, and all the packet processing is actually fast path. Fast path means uh, directly because uh, we, uh, uh, they, the hosts are directly talking to each other after the initial ARP call and the ARP responder call. And, and the fact that MISA doesn't really take any packet and send it out to open flow controller or uh, 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 everything is happening at the device uh, driver for the NIC, okay? And the containers, uh, 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 in turn, kind of, uh, they receive the packet directly from very first packet itself all the time, basically, from then on. See. And there's no need for power flow monitoring, just like Andromeda uh, folks do that, you know. Uh, so, uh, so it's all direct uh, direct path all the time, basically. So, 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 this is great. So this is basically a very base level functionality we build, which you can typically build that using OBS as well, but obviously it's much more optimal and much more efficient. But we went ahead, actually we went further. We, we, we actually extended this to add a lot more functionality to it. Okay, so because if you think so far, what we actually done is we have replaced the functionality of open vSwitch, Linux page and IP tables with a simple, simple 4K XTP uh, program, basically. Okay, so <clears throat> now, so we thought, okay, so let's actually modify the architecture of the XTP program, the main XTP uh, program, a little, little bit. Okay, so we have instead of having one single XTP program, we have many of them. Okay, and we attach one of the XTP program to the NIC and call it a primary XTP. Okay. And then when we and, and then we attach multiple other XTP programs, and then based on certain matching condition in the primary uh, XTP uh, uh, program, like uh, for example, matching an IP address for an endpoint, we tail call an XTP program. So by doing that, you can see that you can build a chain, actually, a chain of uh, functions. So so the rest of the session is going to be covered by Futran, and uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Fu. For, uh, uh, take it over, Fu. Thanks. Thanks, Deepak. Hi, everyone. This is Fu Tran, and I'm a developer on the Mizar project. Today, I will be going over the management plane, some numbers, and a quick demo for Mizar. The Mizar management plane is built with Kubernetes. Using CRDs, we are able to extend the Kubernetes API with our own custom objects. Some of these objects are generic to any networking solution, while others are specific to Mizar. Using the Kubernetes operator framework, we are able to extend Kubernetes with domain-specific controllers for our CRDs. Three fundamental components make up the Mizar management plane. These are CRDs, workflows, and operators. Our objects are defined through the Kubernetes CRD API under the Mizar.com resource group. The operators then expose interfaces for us to act on these custom objects. Finally, the lifecycle of these objects are then handled by workflows. Each of these workflows are triggered by state changes in the respective objects. For example, 
a droplet object, which represents a physical interface on a node, will trigger the management plane delete workflow if its corresponding physical interface were to be removed. The Mizar management plane defines six CRDs. These are VPC, divider, network, bouncer, endpoint, and droplet. The VPC object details information about the VPC such as its CIDR range, its ID, and its list of dividers. The divider object has information about the divider's parent VPC and its host information such as the IP and MAC of the host. The network object has information about the network's VPC, its own CIDR range, and its list of bouncers. The bouncer object details information about the bouncer's parent network and its host IP and MAC. The endpoint object has information about the endpoint's type, its parent network, and the endpoint's IP and MAC. Finally, the droplet object has information about its current host interfaces, IP and MAC. In addition to our custom objects, we also handle the built-in default Kubernetes objects. Currently, we handle Kubernetes pods, nodes, and services. Pods and services directly relate to Mizar's simple and scaled endpoints, respectively. Nodes and their corresponding interfaces correspond to Mizar droplets. For example, if a pod or service is created, the Mizar management plane will trigger a workflow to create endpoints. Similarly, if a node is added to the cluster, a droplet object will be created for each interface on that node. Now, we will go over some preliminary performance numbers for Mizar. In our setup, we saw that Mizar achieves near line rate packets per second at around 600k PPS. With direct path, Mizar minimizes the round trip time and is faster than OVS. Even with the first packet going through an extra hop at the bouncer, the PPS processed by the endpoints remains close to line rate. Mizar has minimal memory overhead, both during at idle and during performance tests. With 100 endpoints per host, the memory overhead on the bouncers remains at baseline level. However, the endpoint host memory utilization increases as more endpoints are provisioned. This is an improvement that we can do by having all endpoints on the host share the same transit agent. Compared to OVS, Mizar has significantly less CPU overhead on both the bouncer and endpoint hosts. Currently, TCP performance on Mizar caps out at around 4 gigabits per second. This can be improved by running the XTP programs in driver mode, which requires NIC support. Furthermore, XDP currently does not support hardware checksumming and TSO. However, there is ongoing work to support this. All right, let's roll the demo. For this demo, we will use Docker containers to simulate physical hosts. In this first part, we demonstrate intra and inter network connectivity, network isolation, and the effects of removing and adding bouncers and dividers. Here, we are sending updates to the daemon running on each host via RPC to provision VPCs, networks, dividers, bouncers, and endpoints.
In this next part, we show the effects of adding an additional bouncer to reduce network congestion. Here, we demonstrate how Mizar Direct Path works within the same network. Next, we demonstrate Mizar Direct Path across subnets. Finally, this part demonstrates Mizar on Kubernetes and the scaled endpoint being used as a replacement for the traditional implementation of Kubernetes services. So that's it for today's presentation on Mizar. Thank you everyone for tuning in. 
please visit github.com forward slash futureway hyphen cloud forward slash Mizar to learn more and try it out for yourself. Also, please look forward to the next presentation about Arctos and its usage of Mizar as a networking provider. Hi, everybody. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Get back. Yeah, so we, have, we just, uh, yeah, any question? I know there were a bunch of questions in the chat window, and we've been answering those questions. So before we transition to the next uh, presentation, we set aside some time. You know, if you folks have any questions, uh, Fu and I could answer. No. Uh, so I think we can we can uh, if you folks uh, you know have do have some questions about it you know about uh, meets our networking we can always do that at the end of the the the, the session tutorial as well. So in the meanwhile you know we'll hand it over to Shaoning and uh, Hongwei for uh, their their presentation. Go ahead, Shaoning. Okay, thank you, Deepak. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiaoning. Uh, in the opening remarks, we, um, we mentioned that there are two projects, uh, Arctos and Misa in Centaurus. Um, Deepak and Fu have talked about uh, uh, Misa. In our presentation, Hongwei and I will talk about uh, Arctos and how it works with Misa. Uh, we have a recorded video, we will play that. And uh, in the meantime, Hongwei and I will be online to address any questions. Feel free to raise the questions if you have. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. My name is Xiaoning. In this talk, my colleague Hongwei and I will talk about Arctos and Misa. In the previous talk, Deepak and Fu has shared a lot of information about Misa, including its architecture and how Misa works. In this talk, we continue to discuss Misa, but from a different perspective. Misa is an independent network service. This means it can support different computing clusters like uh, Kubernetes or OpenStack Nova or other computing clusters. In this talk, we talk about Arctos, our own computing cluster, and how its network model looks like, and how we use Misa to implement such a network model. This is our agenda. Our talk mainly includes three parts. In the first part, we will first give a background information about the project Arctos and Misa, so you can know what Arctos is and its relationship to the project Misa. Uh, we also give a brief introduction to the three major features in project Arctos. As you will see, Arctos is derived from Kubernetes. So starting from the second part, we will talk about Arctos network model. You will see how Arctos network model is different than the flat model in project Kubernetes, and also what kind of elements we have in Arctos network model. Arctos network model can be implemented by different network providers. In the third part, we will focus on how we use Misa to implement Arctos network model, including its CRD-based control plane and XDP-based data plane. I will cover the first part, and then Hongwei will talk about the network model and the control plane in the second part. And I will continue to talk about data plane after Hongwei. OK, let's get started with the first part, project introduction. The first question you might have is, what is Arctos? Arctos is one of the two major projects on the Project Centaurus umbrella. Arctos is for the large-scale cloud computer orchestration, while Misa is for cloud virtual networking. Arctos and Misa, they sit side by side, work together to build a large-scale cloud infrastructure. If you are familiar with the project OpenStack, you can think of Arctos as a rule of Project Nova in OpenStack, while Misa as a rule of Neutron in OpenStack. 
This probably will help you understand the relationship between Arctos and Misa. Why do we want to start Arctos? Arctos Vision is a large-scale open-source cloud infrastructure for next-generation workloads. When we talk about next-generation infrastructure or next-generation workloads, the way we think of it is, if we look at it from application perspective, these applications are not only VMs, they are also containers, functions, and lots of them will be AI-driven applications. And if we look at the infrastructure, the infrastructure is not only about the cloud data centers, it's also about the edge size and 5G, etc. And combining these two different perspectives, Arctos want to build a next generation cloud infrastructure with built in optimizations for these new workload types and leverage this new infrastructure better. Because these workloads are not only about VMs, lots of them will be containers. Project Arctos decided to start with uh, Kubernetes. It's derived from a Kubernetes codebase. Therefore, we can have the mature container support that's already available in Kubernetes. But on top of that, we made a lot of um, core fundamental design changes. We already implemented three major features here. One is the unified container VM orchestration, and the cloud scalability, and the multi-tenancy. We are also planning some other features like uh, uh, cloud and edge scheduling, cloud edge secure communication, and uh, uh, AI optimizations. But for today's talk, I will give introduction to these three uh, implemented features in the next few slides. Before we jump into the details of these three major features, I want to first give a high-level overview of the relationship between Arctos and Misa. This diagram shows how Arctos and Misa work together in a cloud data center. You can see all the hosts in a cloud data center are managed by Arctos and Misa at, at the same time. On each host, we have a computing agent which reports to the Arctos control plane. And we also have a networking agent reports to the MISA control plane. These components work together to schedule workloads on different hosts and make sure these work uh, workloads can communicate with each other. What I want to say here is why this is a recommended combination. Both Arctos and MISA are independent uh, service. They can work with different computing clients and networking services. For example, Arctos, its network model is based on a uh, plugin style. For MISA, we have a, a plugin called Network Controller for MISA. It's running in Arctos and interacting with the MISA control plane to finish the integration between Arctos and MISA. If we want to use another network service, let's say, OpenStack Neutron or AWS, we can also do that. We just replace this plugin, this controller. Arctos itself is neutral to different network providers. Vice versa, on networking part, MISA itself is also an independent network service. It provides its public APIs, and it can work with different computing clusters, regardless it's Arctos, or, or Kubernetes or other computing clusters. Both of them are independent cloud services. They can work together, but they can also work with other networking or computing services. This is the architecture of Arctos. As we mentioned earlier, Arctos is derived from Kubernetes. If you are familiar with Kubernetes, you will see some uh, uh, similar components here. For example, we have API server, we have uh, uh, data stores, and we have a scheduler, and we have different controllers. But the uh, key design change we made here, first is for scalability. For example, for data stores, we support multiple ICD clusters. Because for very large cluster, um, you cannot save all the data into one ATCD cluster. In this case, 
we support multiple ATCD clusters, and they can work together. And also, for the API server, in the Kubernetes design, one API server will hold all the caches. Uh, this will not work if the cache data is too large. So we implement a partition for API servers. And uh, for Kubernetes controllers, in the original design, they are active and standby uh, architecture. So anytime there is only one controller instance is working. And we implemented the active-active uh, architecture. So all the controller instances are working at the same time to balance the workload and provide high availability. This is about scalability. And we also implemented built-in multi-tenancy. In Kubernetes, there is no multi-tenancy. Uh, they only provide some uh, level, some level of isolation using namespace mechanism, but it's not strong enough for a multi-tenancy cloud infrastructure. We implemented a strong multi-tenancy model, so each tenant won't be uh, impacted by other tenants. In fact, they don't see each other at all. And uh, the third part is uh, we implemented the unified container and the VM orchestration. Uh, the original Kubernetes, they, they only support containers, but we extend the pod definition to VMs. So both VMs and the containers, they can be scheduled and handled in a similar way. And you can just use one resource pool to support all these workloads. I will cover all these details in the next few slides. In addition to these uh, three uh, features, we are also working on some new features, like uh, cross-cloud and edge scheduling and the cloud and the edge secure communication. This we will talk about in some other talk. In this next uh, three slides, I'm going to cover these uh, three major features with a little more details. The first feature I want to talk about is uh, the native VM support. Actos is derived from Kubernetes, but Kubernetes only support containers. We know in, uh, in reality there are not of VM applications in addition to container applications. Of course, you can use two different systems to orchestrate these containers and applications. But having two different systems will lead to many problems. For example, you need to maintain and evolve two different systems. And these systems have different resource pools. It's not easy for you to move some machines from one resource pool to another resource pool. That's why we started this feature, native VM support. We added the VM support into Actos. So with one system, we can support both container applications and VM applications. In Kubernetes, there are also some uh, efforts to support VMs, uh, like a KubeVert. But they are taking an add-on approach. That means they introduce a new object like a, called a VM for, the, for VM applications. And on top of that new VM object, they have VM replica set, VM stateful set, etc. What we do here is we have a native VM support. That means we didn't introduce new objects. Instead, we extend the pod object to contain the VM, uh, VM applications. On the left side, I have a screenshot. You can see Within a pod, we can have a VM or have containers. And the experience is very similar to, to customers. They can use one pod or object to contain VMs or applications. The good about this approach is because we are extending this pod object, all the other components on top of pod can work the same way and work with the VM application as well. So we can have unified scheduling, unified controllers and agent. We don't need a separate schedule or controllers for VMs. After we have this native VM support, the value for customers is first, they can run their legacy VM applications and, and, uh, and their container applications together on a single cluster. They have to. They don't. They don't need to separate a different cluster for different applications. And second, in the container world, 
they are not so uh, popular, uh, very useful workload patterns like a replica set, state for set, etc. Now they can apply this orchestration patterns into VM applications as well. It's not only used for container applications. Now it's kind of one plus one greater than two. And the value for cloud provider is first, they can only have one single resource pool. By resource pool, I mean I mean this machine pool. This machine pool is shared by both container applications and the VM applications. They don't need to allocate different small resource pools. The resource utilization is much better. And second, they can uh, just uh, maintain and operate one single software stack. They don't have to um, uh, maintain and evolve two different uh, two different stacks. That's a big advantage of this native VM support. The next feature I want to talk about is uh, multi-tenancy. In Kubernetes, there is no multi-tenancy. Kubernetes uh, provides namespace as a basic mechanism to isolate workloads, but it's not enough for a true multi-tenancy environment. For example, um, multiple tenants need to make sure there are no naming conflicts for namespaces, and uh, there are also lots of non-namespace scoped objects which are shared by all the tenants. So in Actos, we implemented a built-in uh, strong multi-tenancy model. We introduce a new isolation concept called a tenant space. All the API resources are put in different uh, spaces. Each tenant has a space, and by default, a tenant a tenant cannot access other tenants' space. So first, they are strongly isolated, and second, because all the resource objects are confined to one space, they don't need to worry about these naming spaces or different access controls. They, sim they simply have their own copy of the original uh, resource hierarchy. Here we show an example how uh, a talent how a talent has its own space T1, and they can put any resources under this space. And in the backend storage, we also put this uh, space into the storage key, so they are stored um, separately. But this ch changes the API format and resource resource path. So we introduced another uh, feature called a short path. Basically, customers can still use their old uh, API and uh, UI to access their resources. Inside API server, we have a module which will dynamically translate this uh, short path to the internal full path. And we do this based on the access credential associated with this request. So we know uh, which talent space this request should it, uh, it should go, even the customer didn't specify the talent space. With this approach, we implemented a transparent, uh, strongly isolated multi-tenancy model. Now, different talents can share a physical cluster, but uh, each of them feel like they are using this cluster exclusively. They are not impacted by other talents, and they do not even aware of the existence of other talents. The last feature I want to talk about is the scalability. Kubernetes only supports a few thousand hosts, but this is not enough for a large-scale cloud platform, especially the public cloud. In Actos, we made a few core design changes and our scalability goal is to support 300,000 hosts with a single control plane. In order to achieve this goal, we made, uh, we basically we make sure uh, all the components in the cluster uh, can scale out. First, for the etcd data store, we support multiple etcd clusters, and, uh, and we change the resource version generation mechanism to ensure these different clusters can work together just like a virtual large cluster. And for the API server, uh, because each API server holds a copy of the cached data, we introduce the partition into API server. So API server can have different groups, and they can scale out. They are not limited to the capacity of a single API server machine. For the controller and schedulers, we also introduced the uh, workload partition. Based on the uh, 
hash uh, based on the hash key of the workloads. They are distributed to different uh, controller instances, and these controller instances are working uh, uh, in an active active way, so they can balance the workloads and also are high, highly available. With these three major changes, we make sure all the components in the system can scale out. There are no, there are no single system bottleneck. I think this is pretty much uh, what I have for the first part. Uh, to do a quick recap, I introduced what Actos is. It's a relationship with Nisa and the key features in Actos. Next, I will hand over to Hongwei. Hongwei will introduce the new network model in Actos and how we use MISA to implement this network model. Thanks, Xiaolin. Arctos is developed on top of Kubernetes. Kubernetes has a very simple network model, which is a flat one. Look at this picture. All our pods connect to each other by their IP addresses. The IP address is assigned from a single shared IP pool which was specified when the cluster was bootstrapped. The IP address assigned to each part must be unique. They can't duplicate. This single IP range conflicts with Arcto's multi-tenancy because each tenant doesn't want to deal with the potential IP conflicts with other tenants. They just don't care. Looking at this picture again, there is another issue. Any pass is able to connect to all other pass in the cluster. This is fully connected, and this is a default behavior, which might not be desired in some situation where security is required. In order, in order to overcome this limitation, Kubernetes introduced network policy to provide some level of network security. However, the security provided by this means is not very secure. It is able to regulate good guys, but it fails to prevent the bad guy doing malicious things. Let me explain a little bit. First, abuse or even misuse of neighbors would break the planned security, which is brittle in nature anyway. Second, it does not prevent a packet of sleeper put at some places where the traffic is passing by and extract out the sensitive data. This is not secured. Besides that, many implementation for network policy security are leveraging a Linux feature called NetFilter. It might sound good to have finer grain network policy. However, in nature, uh, in reality, it needs to massive number of IP table rules, which in turn lead to non-negligible performance heat and increased network latency, which is not so good. In this flat network model, Kubernetes, uh, Arctos only have, uh, Kubernetes only have single shared DNS. This DNS singleton is not desired by Arctos multi-tenancy because each tenant only wants to see the name records of that tenant and does not want to know any name records from any other tenant. Since Kubernetes flat network model cannot meet the requirements of Arctos multi-tenancy, it is necessary to introduce a brand new network model here, which is isolated one. The primary goal for this isolated model is to provide strong isolation across tenant spaces and across network boundaries inside same tenant spaces. The strong isolation means resources allocated in one scope 
are unrelated to resource allocated in another scope. Taking a picture here, the re resources allocated in tenant A has nothing to do resource allocated in tenant B. Looking inside tenant A, there are two networks. Resources allocated in one network has nothing to do those inside another network. They are totally isolated. In one network, it is still possible to apply the network policy to provide one more layer of network security if you want to. The network policy based security is supplementary to the network based strong isolation. They can live together. So we have a brand new isolated network model. The cornerstone of this isolated network model is network. The network is introduced by Arctos, and it is a new custom-defined resource type. Below is an example of an object of that type. The network object defined in this way represents an isolation boundary of network resources. This list are some network resources that are network specific. For example, parts of one network cannot access to and cannot be accessed by parts from any other networks. In this way, it provides a very strong isolation with regards to the uh, network resources. We have described uh, the Arctos isolated model and its core concept of network objects. Then, how does Arctos implement such an isolated model? The answer is, actually, Arctos by itself cannot achieve this model alone. It needs to work together with so-called network solution provider to fulfill this goal. Looking at this picture, the API server, which is the central uh, data store for Arctos system, keeps the critical data needed for running cluster, including paths, surfaces, and uh, network objects, of course. Besides other building controllers, Arctos puts two additional controllers specially purposed for multi-tenancy and uh, nav isolation. One is tenant controller, the other is network controller, respectively. Whenever a new tenant is created in the system, network controller kicks in to ensure that there will be a default network objects created for that tenant. Whenever a new network object is created in the system, the network controller kicks in to take action to create essential network infrastructures such as DNS. Besides the building uh, Arctos components, the external network provider should put some needed components running as part of Arctos master. These running uh, components are collecti collectively called network provider control suite. Uh, typically, they include various controllers for uh, node, for network, for service, for pods, and the ingress, etc. So, the Arctos building components 
such as API server and uh, building controllers with the joint force provided from network solution provider implements such an isolated model altogether. We had to talk about Actos and the external network provider in general. Talk about how they work together at a very high level. Now, let's look at specifically Actos working with Misa. Misa is a recommended network solution provider of Actos. It has been introduced in previous talk. First, let's take a look at the node provisioning process. A new node joins a cluster. Actos registers the cluster in the API server. The MISA node agent will be installed by the daemon set which is already running on the workload. Meanwhile, MISA node agent uh, node controller will detect the, the new node and notify the MISA system, requesting the MISA system to prepare the node. How the node preparation goes is totally MISA network provider implementation detail. After the node has been prepared inside the MISA system and the, the node agent has been properly installed on workload, that node can be marked as ready. And the Arctos will schedule part to run on that workload in the future. Next. We will take another high level view to see what would happen if a new network, a new part, new service is being created. Look at this picture here. We have a tenant A, already have two existing networks. Both have services, uh, both have resources specific to them. The first thing we want to do is create a network. When the network is created, the DNS has been already deployed and running with the IP address assigned from uh, the network specific range. The next thing is we want to create a new part in the network. The part get its IP address assigned from the IP specific range as well and uh, is able to connect to other IP of the same network. For example, this pod is able to connect to the DNS by the IP. Uh, the next thing we want to do is create a service. Uh, the service gets its IP as virtual IP assigned. Uh, and uh, the MISA network provider will finish the plumbing to map this virtual IP to the real IP of the part as a backend IP. What if now we want to add one more path to the same service? The new part will get its IP assigned properly and uh, the MISA network provider will pick up the event and updates the backend IP pool for that specific service, then it will balance the node between these two parts instead of the previous only one. The point is, Arctos working together with MISA network provider is able to present a strongly isolated network model. That concluded my simplified view of Arctos and the Mizar control plane. 
I will hand it over to Xiaoling. Thank you, Hongwei. Hongwei just talked about uh, Arctos network model and how we leverage MISA to implement the Arctos network model. It's mostly about the control plane, about these CRD objects. In this last part, I will talk about things happening on the work nodes, including what components do we have on our workload, and what happens when a pod is launched, and what happens when a pod communicates with other pods and communicates with the service. Let me first start with the components we have on our host. If we look at this diagram, this shows all the components we have on our host. First, we have user space and kernel space on the host. In user space, we have two agents, the Arctos agent and the Misa agent. They each talk to their own control plane uh, and listening for the instructions from the control plane. And we also have a CNI plugin for Misa. This CNI plugin is invoked by the Arctos agent, but it will interact with the Misa agent uh, to finish all the wiring work when a pod is launched. First, when the, this uh, host is initialized, this MISA agent will attach uh, the XTP program on the main network interface. This is to process any incoming pro packets. At that time, um, because we do not have any ports scheduled on the host yet, so we do not have any purport name, network namespaces. So what happens when a pod is uh, created? First, when a pod is created, the MISA network controller, the, or the plugin in Actos, it will watch the event of the pod creation. It noticed a new pod has arrived. That plugin will call the uh, MISA control plane to create a corresponding endpoint for that pod basically assigning the IP. And the MISA control plane will uh, notify the MISA agent on this host, uh, telling him, hey, I have a new endpoint created on this host. You need to initialize the virtual network interface, uh, network interface for this endpoint. What the agent will create is a VS pair and, and attach the XTP program, the, the transit agent on one end of this VS pair. Initially, this VS pair is created in the host network namespace. Because at that time, the pod hasn't arrived on this host yet. It doesn't know which network namespace will be assigned to that pod. After that, the Arctos agent will get the pod definition from the Arctos control plane. It will create the network namespace for that pod. And it will call the MISA CNI plugin to initialize the virtual network interface for that network namespace. Here, what it happens is different depending on it's a VM pod, or it's a VM pod or a container pod. If it's a container pod, the, the work is, uh, is simple. The CNI plugin will move one one end, the other end of the VS pair, into the container network namespace. And this end, this end of the VS pair will act as the VNIC of this container. So any packets arrived on this end of the VS pair will go out on the other end and captured by our transit agent XTP program. What happens for the VM port is a little different. The CNI plugin will also move the other end of the VS pair into the network namespace. But because Kumo now cannot uh, use this, uh, this end of the VS pair as a VNIC directly, we have to do a little more wiring work. We will, have a, um, we will have a switch here, and we create a tap device attached to this switch. And we uh, use a, a file descriptor of this tap device as a, as a parameter to the a VM, the QMO process, as a uh, VNIC device. We are trying to optimize this part to uh, uh, gain better performance. But for both cases, when this wiring work is done, the CNI plugin will return to the network agent, uh, sorry, to the Arctic agent, 
basically telling it that the uh, virtual network device has been set up in this uh, network namespace and the agent can continue to set up other stuff and uh, start the pod. This is what happens when a pod uh, is launched on a host and how these components work together to set up the uh, virtual network device for this pod. Now let's see what happens when a pod tries to talk to another pod with Misa's XTP networking. This diagram shows the components on two different hosts. And we can see we have two ports, um, port 1 on host 1 and port 2 on host 2. Each pod has its own virtual IP. What happens when pod 1 talk to pod 2 is First, the user space pod uh, application. It uh, calls some socket API to write some buffer, buffer data. And this part of data will be encapsulated by, uh, by the network stack in this pod's network namespace. Because each network namespace has its own network stack. It will eventually become a uh, L2 packet and arrive, arrived at this end of the VS pair. Because it's a VS pair, the packet will go out on, on this side and then captured by the XTP program. This XTP program, the transit agent, will encapsulate this packet to an overlay packet. To be uh, exact, in the MISA case, it will be a packet based on Geneva protocol. And this pa overlay packet will go out through the main interface and to one of the bouncers. On, on this uh, host, on the source host, it maintains a list, uh, a list of the bouncers for each subnet. So based on the uh, port 2 IP the, um, subnet, it knows uh, what bouncers it, ha it have. And then it will randomly choose one bouncer based on the uh, hash value of this five tuple. Let's say in this case, it chooses the bouncer on 10.003. So the, uh, the outgoing packet will have an outer destination with 10.003. When this packet arrives the bouncer, the bouncer maintains a map. It knows uh, which host has which endpoint. So uh, it, it knows that the target endpoint, the endpoint of port 2 is actually hosting on host 2. So it will modify the out destination to 10.10.2. 10 uh, uh, actually, I made a typo here. Here, here should be 10.00.2. So the packet goes here. And uh, on this host, uh, the main XDP program on, on this zero will decapsulate this packet uh, and uh, change it to an uh, inner packet again and send to the corresponding uh, with pair. And then go, go up all the way to the pod 2. This is how uh, the communication happens with this uh, MISA XTP program. But one thing I need to uh, emphasize here is um, after the first packet, um, the, the XTP program on the source, uh, source host will receive a packet telling it that the endpoint 2 is actually hosting on the host 2. So it will have a cache item on, on, on here. Next time, when an, another packet arrive for, the, for this endpoint, it will send directly to the host tool. So it won't go through the bouncer uh, every time. This will save, uh, save the latency. The last part is about the uh, port to service connectivity. In Kubernetes or in Arctos, a service is like a load balancer. It provides a stable service IP to a dynamic backend pod pod pool. So you don't have to use this dynamic pod IP directly. You can use this stable service IP. What happens with Actos and Misa is similar to the pod to pod connectivity. Here, the pod application, they just send the packets to the service IP. So here, the, um, let's say the service IP is uh, 
1.2. So this service IP is still in the overlay packet. It's an inner destination. But what happens at the bouncer is the bouncer maintains a hash table. It knows what backend port is included for this service IP. So when it sees such a service IP, it will dynamically change it to uh, one of the backend port IP. So you will see for this overlay packet, the bouncer changes both the outer destination and also the inner destination. And then um, this packet will be sent to the uh, backend host. And similarly, um, similar to the what happened to port to port communication, it's uh, decapsulated and sent to the target port. Um, it's uh, the direct path also works here. After the first packet, the uh, first packet goes through uh, the, this process. There is a cache item will be uh, created on the source host. So the next time, the packet will be sent to the, uh, the this backend pod directly, um, instead of going through the bouncer again and again. Uh, this uh, is uh, the end of our talk. So we talked about well, what. Arctos project is um, its a relationship with uh, Misa and its key features. And we spend a lot of time on Arctos network model. We talked about how it's different than the uh, Kubernetes flat network model and how we can leverage Misa to implement such a network model, including the, uh, the CRD based control plane and the XDP based data plane. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to bring up. Uh, we also include some links here. It points to our project repo and the design docs, roadmap milestones. Feel free to check out. That's all. Thank you. Okay, that's our presentation. Uh, before we move forward to the next presentation, is there any question for, for this talk? Okay, if you have questions, uh, you can put it in the Q&A session anytime. Or uh, feel free to uh, visit our GitHub repo and uh, um, post the issue or raise it in our uh, Slack channel. Um, without further ado, I will hand over to Dean for the next uh, presentation. Hi everyone, uh, this is Inding. I'm from FutureWay Cloud Lab. So in this session, I'm going to talk about the Kube Edge Go. Uh, so the presentation will have uh, it, the background of the Kube Edge, then the architecture discussion, then uh, we'll go over the community building stuff to show how we open source this project and uh, it's growing healthy and the last part will be a tutorial. I will show you. Uh, it's very easy to uh, build and deploy Kubeedge based on Kubernetes. The last part will be a Q and A session. Kubeedge. So Kubeedge is a, a CNCF project. So uh, this one we donated to the uh, CNCF uh, at the early beginning of uh, 2019. So uh, in March 2019. Uh, Kube Edge entered the CNCF sandbox, and we just graduated uh, in September. We entered the CNCF incubation uh, phase. So basically, we graduate from sandbox and enter the incubation phase. The next step is to graduate from incubation be to become a formal CNCF project. So Kube Edge. Kube Edge uh, is built upon of uh, Kubernetes. So we use the Kube Edge to provide a fundamental infrastructure to support network application deployment, uh, lifecycle management, metadata synchronization between the cloud and edge. So the motivation behind this is about uh, Kubernetes is a, a strong, it's a popular tool, a platform to manage resources in the inside the data center. 
However, with a lot of a hybrid cloud and also a lot of a node is in the far side. For example, a small server are running on the enterprise network or even a, a very small IoT gateway running inside your home, but you want to uh, control it from the cloud. So it is not possible uh, before and the to to a uh, developer application on this uh, IoT gateway or is a really high bar. Uh, we use uh, embed. We probably require a embedded engineer to, to build an embedded application on the, such a uh, IoT gateway. Also, the OTA update or a, a play, application deployment and management. We require a uh, physical to show up or you need to build the OTA system yourself. It's not easy to maintain. <clears throat> so in order to leverage uh, Kubernetes, a flexible application deployment and management, so we uh, build KubeEdge onto the uh, Kubernetes to solve this uh, cloud edge communication problem to provide network and the uh, application deployment and management issues. So the major challenge to solve these questions, first, network reliability and bandwidth limitation. Because uh, Kubernetes just solved the problem inside data center. So master node and worker node have a fast and reliable network connection. So the latency is very low and the bandwidth you can assume almost unlimited. <laughs> However, if the worker node is on the edge side, this means it's connected through a uh, ISP, it's a public internet. So the network connection is not reliable. It's maybe uh, down and up. Also the bandwidth has a uh, limited limitation. If at your home, you may have 100 megabytes or even lower 20 megabytes internet connection. Even in a uh, small enterprise or a small office, you may not have a, a large bandwidth. So if you <clears throat> transfer all your data up to the cloud, it may drain your, your bandwidth. So you don't want to do that. And also there's maybe a resource constraint on the edge node. For example, if you're running an application on a uh, home use IoT gateway, it's may as low as uh, 250 50 megabytes memory or uh, one even lower 128 megabytes a memory is a very old model if it is. <clears throat> and also the CPU is uh, not powerful in that uh, IoT gateway either. The other problem where the, the challenge we have is the highly distributed and heterogeneous device management uh, for the IoT booming with the edge computing. So there's maybe a lot of devices connect to the IoT gateway or edge node, but that is highly distributed even uh, either from network point of view or the uh, geo uh, distribution. Also, all the devices are heterogeneous. There's all, uh, a lot of a kind of a devices could connect to the node. So that's a hard problem we need to solve. So in order to meet this challenge and solve the problems, the Kube Edge uh, uh, provides this ability first, seamless cloud edge communication. So this communication, not only for the data, but also for the metadata. So we uh, made it transparent to the end user. So uh, transfer data and metadata between cloud edge on the back end. Edge autonomy, basically, uh, as we said, the network connection between the edge and the cloud may not be reliable. That means uh, the internet could be down for the edge site. So if that happens, so we need an autonomous operation on the edge. So after it's disconnected, uh, in the Kubernetes case, the master management plan, when management plan may think the node is dead and evict all the application from the node and market is uh, offline. However, in the edge case, we cannot do that. 
we need a special treatment for that. Also, uh, we need the edge node to manage the application life cycle on the node, even the it is connect, uh, disconnected to the uh, uh, master management plan. And also after it's connection restored, we need to sync metadata from the cloud to the worker node to ensure all the application and the resource are in the desired state that the management plan required. The third, we uh, could add to provide a low resource. Uh, the low resource uh, is only require low resource uh, consumption. So basically we can uh, let the Kubernetes run a very uh, resource constrained device, uh, IoT gateway, as we mentioned is 256 megabytes or even uh, as lower as uh, 128 megabytes if we compromise a little bit the ability of the system. Uh, the last one is the simplified device uh, communication. <clears throat> So uh, when a device connect to your uh, edge node IoT gateway, so uh, we have the device twin and device sharing. So basically you can view all the device status from your portal on the cloud. And also you can control this device and issue your desired state uh, from your cloud to your edge node. Eventually uh, control your device connected to the uh, uh, as you know, that's very useful for the IoT and the industry IoT use case. We'll go over some details on the following slides. <coughs> Kubernetes architecture. So in this slide, I'm going to give you a uh, overview of a Kubernetes architecture. Uh, you can see, as I mentioned, the Kubernetes solve the cloud edge and also device connection problem. And that we build upon the Kubernetes. So in, in the center, you can see that the Kubernetes are deployed. So uh, on the cloud side, Kubernetes have a, uh, has a, a cloud core component. It's including a, a few new controllers. It's an edge controller that's uh, basically edge node uh, control. Device controller that's uh, control the device connected to the edge node. Sync controller that solve the problem to sync data and the metadata between the cloud and edge. Cloud hub is basically a uh, component we uh, connect between. Uh, it's the endpoint connect the uh, to support a connection from the uh, edge side. So the, on the edge side, that's the uh, main component we uh, Kubernetes has is a. Uh, Edge core component that's uh, basically a uh, derived from Kubelet. It can show the uh, container lifecycle on the edge side. So on the edge, we support uh, mainstream uh, CRI runtime, including uh, container D, Docker, CRL. We also uh, have a brief uh, connect uh, support for the C9 to connect to network and also the CSI. <clears throat> so uh, another for the device, there's a mosquito component. Basically we support MQTT protocol. So device can use a model bus, Bluetooth, or the industry OPC UA protocol to connect to the edge node. And uh, in this case, uh, we can reflect all, that's a pop sub model. So in this case, uh, from cloud side, you can see the status of a device connect to the edge, and also you can control it. Uh, between the cloud edge, we have a, a connection uh, through a WebSocket connection. Uh, because uh, we do this way, uh, besides uh, WebSocket, you can also choose a quick uh, protocol to connect the edge to uh, cloud. We designed this way because uh, in most of the case, the edge is running behind an enterprise firewall or your home firewall. Your edge node probably doesn't have a public IP, so you cannot uh, 
control or connect to the edge node directly from the uh, control plane or cloud core from the cloud side. So what we do is we initiate the connection from edge to cloud, set up a WebSocket connection, the long, <coughs> the long connection. So in this way, you can issue your control command from the cloud to the edge and the edge send data back to the cloud. Uh, let's drill down a little bit. For the cloud side, let's, uh, uh, as we mentioned, we have this component at the Kube Edge as this new component called Edge Controller Device or Controller or Device API, Sync Controller, Kube Edge CSI Driver and Admission Webhook. So uh, you can see we still have that uh, Kubernetes master. Uh, the device controller, edge controller, sync controller, uh, you, it's a CRD controller, they list watch uh, to the uh, Kubernetes, uh, the endpoint is the API server. Then uh, this uh, controller use a cloud hub to connect to, to the edge node. As we uh, present in the previous slides, we use a web socket protocol as default. You may choose a quick and also we have a uh, CSI driver and the admission webhook. That's for the uh, control, uh, connection control and uh, the storage. So the edge controller uh, to manage the node, the pod and the config map, that's the proxy. You can see it's a shadow management. You can see that the proxy from the Kubernetes to the edge and device controller is do the device modeling and also shadow management uh, for all the devices on the edge side. Sync controller, as I said before, is a reconcile and inconsistent. When uh, inconsistent data detect from the cloud to the edge, it's probably is from a uh, uh, connection loss and the restore in that case. And CSA driver is uh, for the uh, uh, storage provisioning and admission hook is the uh, API validation and uh, back best practice enforcement. Let's come to the edge side. We already talked about uh, from cloud with Cloud Hub as the uh, entry point and connection point uh, for the cloud side to all connection from the edge. So in the counterpart, we have an edge hub on the edge side. Basically is um, take all the messaging uh, and it's the hub to connect all that connection a message sent back to the cloud and a set, a receive the message from the cloud. That's uh, by default, they use WebSocket. And also we have a Met Manager, that's a metadata manager. That's a, it's a load level metadata persistent. So we have a local edge store, it's a local database. And also we have a device twin. A device twin that uh, for the protocol, we sync a device status uh, from the device to the edge. Then eventually we uh, sync back to the cloud. Uh, edge D, edge D, we uh, derive from a kubelet that we call it the kubelet light. So basically is do the pod management and <clears throat> to, uh, so we can create a pod and the delete the pod also. And that one, so with that one, we can uh, control the uh, pod lifecycle and create pod even uh, the connection between the cloud and edge is broken. The last one is the event bus. That's it's basically MQTT uh, client support pop up model. We can uh, uh, collect the status from the uh, device. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, Kubeage already a, a formal CNCF incubation project is approved uh, in September, 2020 is this month. And so we have a, uh, continuous momentum for this project. We already have uh, more than uh, 300. We grow from 30 contributors to more than 300 contributors. It's 
GitHub stars is more than uh, 2,800 and the forks, we almost uh, 800 forks already. And uh, we uh, checked uh, more than uh, 25 organization developers to contribute to our project. And we have uh, maintainers from five different companies. Also, uh, we uh, have a collaborations with other open source community. For example, we are uh, actively involved in the Kubernetes IoT uh, Edge work group. And also uh, with LF Edge, a Crino project, we uh, have a two BP uh, blueprint project using Kubernetes Edge. One is the Elliot uh, blueprint family. It's uh, used that for the uh, lightweighted uh, gateway project. And also there's another one called the Kubernetes Edge Edge Service Blueprint. That's one that's focusing on the AI framework and uh, building AI offloading machine learning on the edge adoptions. So because that's a successful uh, and a very powerful open source project, we have uh, more than 20 plus adopters uh, in this category of uh, IoT and hardware. We have ARM, Samsung, EMQ, and a lot of a carrier is a China Mobile, China Unicom using this project. And also we have uh, IT services and uh, cloud provider. There's a, a few cloud provider already using Kube Edge, building their uh, cloud edge, edge cloud computing product. Atami, uh, uh, academic, there's a few um, university. They have a uh, networking cloud, uh, network, network lab or IoT Edge Lab participate in this uh, project. Uh, now let's go over a uh, user adoption example. So that's a typical uh, one. This is a highway ET system. Uh, so I call it a typical because this uh, reflect the cat challenge I mentioned in the uh, in the previous slides. The first one is uh, as a highly distributed. So that means uh, all the devices it should be on the highway uh, toll gate, uh, toll booth. So that means it's a geo distributed, it's highly distributed. And also does a, uh, also does, it's a have a, may not have reliable uh, internet connection because uh, that's one is in the far edge. This may not have a strong uh, mobile signal. They may not have a direct uh, internet connection. They use a mobile uh, mobile network. It's not reliable and if the signal is not uh, stable. So they may go up and down on the internet connection and the connection bandwidth is it's not high enough, so they uh, have a limited bandwidth. And also the uh, is high a heterogeneous, highly heterogeneous uh, system. Uh, you can see uh, some gate have a 86 a small server there. Some are using ARM server. And also all the device connected, devices connected to the, the edge node are highly heterogeneous. They made from different vendors. So uh, we need to tolerate, we need to handle all these uh, devices. So also the system is a uh, huge, uh, it's more than uh, 50,000 edge node. It's managed in this system. So this system will be a Kubernetes plus Kubernetes edge. And uh, totally that's a uh, more than half a million containers in the system. Every day is collect more than uh, 300 million data per day. So uh, with this system, uh, it's easy for the application developer to deploy a uh, new application from the uh, cloud to the edge. So, and also we transfer edge data back to the cloud. So this include uh, take a picture of a license plate and do the transaction to charge the toll, charge the toll. So uh, 
with this system is improve the performance of uh, a big a big performance boost from the old system. So uh, every time a car is processed, it's from 15 seconds down to two seconds. And the per truck is down uh, from 29 seconds to uh, three seconds. So the Coupe Edge, uh, we uh, do the quarterly release. We do this uh, because we uh, want to be a release as the uh, Kubernetes release. So whenever a uh, Kubernetes release, we uh, take about a month to uh, incorporate a new API change or things and release uh, the uh, Kube Edge release. So we also do quarterly. So you can see that's a lot from uh, we enter the CNCF sandbox. There's a lot of new features deployed it, uh, de developed. And uh, with the three months release, the quarterly release is happening on February, May, August. The next one will be uh, November. So uh, in the May release, uh, we, uh, uh, you can see uh, we already have a continent D, uh, continent D uh, support. And in the uh, May release, we verify the CRL integration and we, can collect a log. We not only do the deployment of the policy deployment from cloud to edge, and also we can cloud uh, collect a log from pod to from the edge to the uh, to the uh, cloud side. In the most recent release, we uh, do a big enhancement for the device management uh, because we have a, a, a we now have a. IoT SIG in our uh, community. And also we have MEC SIG focusing on the mobile edge cloud computing uh, in this SIG. Uh, I'll talk about the detail later. And also, uh, as I said, in the main release, we support collecting log to the edge. Then in the August release 1.4, we uh, support a matrix collection. So we connect, it, connect the, all the data to the uh, matrix server of a Kubernetes native matrix server. So uh, not only to show the cloud status and, and you, you can have uh, perform data for the edge, the, that with that data, you can uh, connect to your portal or a premises to, uh, to do the monitoring. And also uh, we do the edge node certificates rotation. So to enhance the security and uh, we are uh, in August, we support uh, 1.18 uh, Kubernetes. And in the next release we are going to re uh, support 1.19. So we are uh, follow the upstream Kubernetes closely. Now let's uh, have a chance to see uh, how easy, how easy to build a Kubernetes, a Kube Edge project and how easy to use it. So um, the Kube Edge built on Go, lang Go language. So it's easy to build for ARM and Act 86. So uh, you can see if you want to build on the ARM device, you just need to uh, change your Go architecture to ARM and to, uh, to build it for the edge. But because we, that's easy for, uh, that, that's to build the edge core the component for the edge side. But for, for the cloud side, I assume that uh, you are using uh, X86. And, but it's easy to build, also to build a X86. Uh, cloud core part for ARM and uh, as x86, but for current users, they only require ARM for the edge core part component. So uh, if anyone have a uh, ARM want to try the ARM server on the uh, cloud core uh, cloud part, uh, we can also test on that. Uh, we have our CI and the E2E test on the Travis CI. So basically even for the cloud uh, ARM side, we already tested it. However, uh, current users haven't used their uh, ARM devices on the cloud side.
for Kubert yet. Deployment. So uh, deployment, uh, just like Kubernetes, we support, uh, we build a new tool called a KE admin. So that tool is like the Kubra admin to deploy Kubernetes, we have we use this one to deploy Kubernetes. So by default, uh, before uh, 1.3 release, we only need uh, one port 1000 for your cloud core part. As I mentioned, uh, that's for our cloud core. That's the endpoint, the user, uh, the edge to connect it to the cloud part. So uh, you only need a port 1000 open. So then you expose your IP, basically your uh, uh, KE admin uh, init, advice, advice, uh, advertise address, basically the IP, you uh, the out facing IP of the cloud core. So that accept the connection from the edge side. So from 1.3, uh, we also, uh, require, uh, we ask you to open the default pod is uh, 10,002. That's for uh, the edge, uh, the, the log connections. Basically, uh, uh, we need a separate port to collection, uh, to collect the log from the edge side. So uh, if you don't use that log, Kubernetes control log, so you only need a port 10,000 open. You don't need a uh, 10,000 to open if you don't want to collect log from or metrics data from your uh, edge side. For the edge side, basically that the Kube edge workload equivalent to the Kubernetes workload uh, is just on the remote far side on the edge side. So that one, we uh, first do the KE admin get token that's to get your token. Then you will call KE admin draw that's then you need to specify the cloud core IP and the port and also uh, specify your token. So this way uh, the cloud core can authenticate the connection, the, the edge, then let the, the uh, work node join the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, then the, uh, we also can, for the dev, we can support a, uh, we support, a, you can build an advanced user. You can uh, not using a tool, but using a, uh, you build locally and deploy locally. So uh, if you want to set up a cloud site, so first uh, there's a, a few uh, CRD, you want to deploy first one is the device uh, CRD, then device model CRD, then the YAML file, and also the object sync YAML. The last part is to uh, cloud core. Then you start a cloud core uh, process, uh, do the cloud core dash dash min config to generate that uh, cloud core YAML. Then you uh, cloud core, uh, run cloud core using that uh, YAML file as a config file. Then uh, for the edge worker side, basically the workload side. So it's uh, first uh, edge core to uh, output your uh, edge core YAML. Then you uh, need to get your uh, secret uh, to run this command to control, uh, Kube control to get a secret. Then you update with your, uh, a general update in your edge core YAML. The last one will be a start edge core process uh, using the, the YAML. So uh, that's a limitation for this cases because you need a root write to run this. So I, I will, uh, for the time limitation, let me show a, uh, a quick demo.
so this demo will show uh, basically show what I just uh, presented how to uh, deploy a uh, Kube Edge and then even deploy then after you deploy the Kube Edge how you deploy application so you can see that's the two windows the upper one is the edge node the lower one is the uh, cloud node window so currently the cluster let's show it so currently the uh, cluster only have the master basically the cloud node so there's a nothing and then also no uh, workload deploy on this cluster Then now we, as I said, we use the key admin to start the uh, cloud core part. Then let's see if the cloud core is started. Yep, we check the log to see if the cloud core is started. Now let's go to the edge side. First, let's get token uh, for the edge core to use. Now let's start the edge core component. So uh, using the token we just generated. So let's let's see. Uh, it's really fast. Let's see. Uh, let's check the log to make sure the edge core is running. Then let's go back to the cloud part. You can see uh, if we Kube control get a uh, node, you can see uh, besides master node, there's another worker node drawn. We label the row is the edge. It's running a Kube edge 1.3.1 release. So now the cluster have two nodes, master node on the cloud and the edge node on, on the edge. Now let's see, uh, because the Kube Edge is fully compatible uh, with uh, Kubernetes API, then you can use the Kube Control de to deploy application from the cloud to the edge. So the next step is to show you how to use the Kube Control to do the application deployment and management. Now we uh, just do a, a quick deployment. That's a simple app. This a uh, simple NGX app. So uh, that's the uh, uh, deployment YAML. So we just use the Kube control apply that deployment. Let's see, okay. Let's see uh, a new pod is generated and it's running on the edge node. Uh, you can see the IP is the edge node. Now let's go to the uh, Edge node, you can see there's a new uh, Docker container and the pod is run. Basically, the pod is running on the uh, edge side to show. Then you can uh, uh, access this pod using the uh, from remote. So basically, we show. So in this demo, we show, uh, as in the slides we mentioned, we show um, how to deploy the cloud core part on the cloud of using uh, the Kube Edge cloud part of cloud core. And also uh, Kube Edge edge part is a edge core. Then how the edge node drawn the cluster as a worker node of a Kubernetes cluster with a special label is the, the edge row. And also we show we can uh, use the Kube control to deploy the application from the cloud to the edge. You can uh, imagine uh, if you have a, a Kubernetes cluster running on public cloud, 
and you can have a IoT gateway. Uh, if you you are produce a lot of a IoT gateway uh, to the end user, you can control it from the cloud side. You don't need to physically go there to do the update or app deployment. And also you don't need to worry about the OTA update or application update. So that's all handled by the Kube Edge plus Kubernetes uh, platform. <clears throat> so uh, the Kube Edge community is a, a, a mature community. So we have our uh, project website. It's on kubeedge.io. The code, uh, the code repository is on the GitHub. It's already donated to the CNCF. So the owner is the, uh, CN, the Cloud Native Foundation. And the Slack channel is, uh, you can, uh, we are happy to uh, welcome people to join the, uh, the Slack channel mailing list. And also we have a, uh, a community meeting every Tuesday or or Wednesday on uh, Pacific, uh, it's Tuesday on Pacific time and uh, Wednesday in the Asia time. So we have, we host two different comp uh, time. One is more friendly to the North America. The other one is more uh, friendly to the Europe. Mm, it's easy to convert to your time zone. We have the link. The, uh, this meeting is uh, open to everybody because it's open source. The, we follow the, uh, we comply with the uh, CNCF requirement. We record every meeting and publish on the YouTube channel. If you miss the channel, uh, if you miss a meeting, you can always watch the uh, meeting recording uh, from the YouTube. We have the, our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you. That's uh, all about mine. Now, uh, before I hand over to the next presenter, Annie, so any questions? Okay, so let's hand over to Annie. So if you have any questions, uh, always welcome to ask me. And also tomorrow I'm going to have a uh, Q&A on the Slack channel is a, uh, it's a 1 p.m. I think it's uh, Eastern time. So you can always uh, ping me at that time from the Slack channel. Thank you. Annie, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Ian. Hey, um, everyone. Um, thank you so much for dialing in today. And so today we spend majority of the time talking about the Centaurus project. Here, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a context is why we came up with this project. So as we are approaching to the uh, 5G AI era, we understand the workloads that we're facing today are very different from the workloads we're used to. The new workloads require scalability. The new workloads require connecting to the edges and uh, which connect to thousands of billions of um, uh, IoT devices. So we understand that there's a need for this new open source cloud infrastructure project. Thus, we created Centaurus. Centaurus addresses the, the needs of um, the new workloads uh, scalability, and as well as the distributed nature of cloud edge architecture, while keeping the unified resource management of uh, and um, orchestration of various resource types, such as VM, containers, serverless, and maybe some possible future resource types. The current open source projects we see today, um, they either address mostly VM you know, type of workloads separate from the container type of workloads. So we think that moving forward, having this unified way of uh, managing and orchestrating various workloads in a seamless way will be very important. So that gives you a little background why we came up with the Centaurus project. And the use cases can be very interesting. For example, um, you know, for telcos, I'm sure telcos are thinking about, you know, coming up with this maybe 5G cloud that would help them service the, um, you know, help them support the 5G services they have to their clients. And um, 
for financial services, maybe they want to come up with AI cloud that can offer, you know, smart financial services to their partners and customers. And for medical research, maybe they want to come up with um, research clouds that can help all these um, research, uh, medical research professionals from all over the world to attack, um, to tackle some um, research. For example, you know, um, you know, COVID-19, or maybe in the future, we have some other diseases that we would like to mobilize the whole, the entire global medical community research to do the research together. So having a large scaled cloud can definitely help support that. So that's why we came up with um, Centaurus. And today you have heard quite a bit about Mita and Arctos. Mita is the, the networking piece, Arctos is computing piece. And um, both projects have been open sourced for quite a while. We have been socializing those projects with the open source community at various KubeCon events um, in 2019 and 2020. And for this year, we um, sponsor KubeCon EU and also there's a community event in China. We also um, sponsor that event. And um, there's a KubeCon US coming up in November. We'll also have a sponsorship there, so you can also meet us there. For those of you who have missed our um, presentations in the past, don't worry, you can always go to our website, centauriuscloud.io website, and that's where you can get the past event recordings, blogs, and papers. And as you can see, you know, a mature cloud platform is not just networking and and compute. We also need storage, we need security, we need identity, we need monitoring, usability, etc. So we would like to invite you guys, the open source community, to come join us and help us build Centaurus and build round out the, all the feature functionalities and requirements and really make this platform a viable platform that will address the future you know, AI 5G workloads. And we do this project as an open source project. So we do everything based on the open source practice. So in other words, all the designs are open on our website on GitHub. And we um, have open communication. We run open source meetings. We have Zoom, open source um, Zoom calls. We have Slacks, we have email groups. And you know everything we do is open. So we would like to invite you guys. Currently, we have about six member companies, we still have a couple more that we're talking, you know, they, they don't want us to use their logo yet until they get their le uh, legal approval. But um, we're getting momentum in terms of ecosystem building. But again, it's a very early days for Centaurus. So we would like to invite you to come join us and um, go to our website, go to GitHub, and we have a mailing list. And we, def we definitely love to have you join us. Thank you. And for the rest of the time we have, maybe we can open up for questions. Do we have any question on the, you can either send your question via chat or you can just speak up right now. If there's no more questions, so shall we just um, adjourn today's workshop? All right, well, thank you so much for um, hanging there with us for the last three hours. And we really appreciate your time. Again, you know, we would love to talk to you about Centaurus. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, everyone. And again, thank you for attending the uh, tutorial. I believe uh, this tutorial it's recorded and it will be make it public. Uh, we also put all the slides, all the uh, videos that into the uh, Centaurus website, so you can access from there. Um, if I have more questions, we can uh, you can post it in the uh, GitHub on the uh, website and as well as the Slack channel. Uh, again, uh, thank you for attending the tutorials. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye.